Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Pulsa Smith Asia 2020. Now we'd like to introduce Ricardo and share his story a tale about the streaming analytics using Pulsa and Elastic. Elastic. Uh, el elastic. Welcome, Ricardo. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for the introduction and um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I hope you are enjoying this conference, which has been amazing so far. Uh, I have watched some of the previous presentation, and um, I have to tell, I, I'm learning a lot about this amazing technology, which is Pulsar, right? So uh, before we move forward, uh, I'd like to introduce myself for, for those of you that don't know me. My name is Ricardo Ferreira, and uh, I work as a developer advocate in this company called Elastic. Uh, some, of, some of you might know Elastic for the uh, Elasticsearch technology or Kibana or Lagstash. Uh, at Elastic, I'm part of the community team, so basically what I do is developer advocacy for communities such as streaming data uh, technologies, which includes Pulsar, of course, right? Um, so before working for Elastic, I used to work for other companies like, such as Confluent, uh, Red Hat, and Oracle as well. So pretty much my my expertise has been focused on technology such as streaming data, big data, uh, analytics, and databases. So that's what you're probably going to see me like talking about uh, in different channels and conferences such as this one, right? So I've put in here my uh, email context if you want to make any questions after this presentation or follow-up questions. And for those of you that know, we use Twitter, this is my Twitter handle where you can follow me. And then some, from time to time, I post some very interesting things like uh, related to uh, streaming data technologies, right? Uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to, uh, this, this presentation is going to be about talking about streaming data in the context of how to leverage Pulsar and Elastic, right? The purpose of this presentation is focus primarily on what are the architecture changes and design choices that you have to undergo in order to leverage the, what, the, what we call our streaming data, right? But, but I think it's important to understand so we can all be in the same page about what streaming data is, right? So uh, in order to understand what streaming data is, we have to take a look in the back in the past, right? So so far, we have been processing data and employment analytics using this approach, which is basically moving data from one database to another, right? Um, and this is basically, it, it sounds so natural for us uh, looking to a, to a right diagram like this, because that's what we have been doing for, for the last, I don't know, 30 years, right? And throughout the, all this time, we've discovered that SQL databases have limitations, right? So. Uh, but as I said, like we, we've been looking for this diagram and this architecture for so long that it became so natural to us that we forgot that, all right, there are limitations that we have to take care of. And um, those limitations basically has to do with the fact that, okay, have you ever thought that you should not have to move data from one database to another just to perform analytics, right? So uh, conceptually, a database should be able to handle both transactions and analytical processing, right? So, but the reality is, is different, right? The, the reality we know that by the time you start bringing analytics into a database that is supposed to be focused on OLTP, online, online transactional processing, you, you, you eventually going to slow down the database, right? That's what are going to happen with the database. So um, what we have learned is that, okay, in order to avoid this slowness in the database, it's better to separate the workload. So we're going to have a workload. We'll have a database that is focused on transactions, I.O., and all of that. And we're going to have another database which is focused on analytics and aggregations and queries and things that will extract value out of the information, right? So the reason why this happened, right? It, this is not actually uh, news today, right? The, the reason why this happened is because SQL database has been focused on this concept of tables, right? Which you know very well that are basically high level abstractions on top of this like highly optimized and efficient data structure called logs, right? Und underneath any database, whatever is a SQL or no SQL, you all, we always have a log, right? And if, if you look to this diagram over here, which represents a log, you might, for those of, for those of you that are familiar with Apache Pulsar, you, you, you might think about that this is essentially what uh, the ledgers 
architecture that is implemented on the bookkeeper bookkeeper uh, layer does, right? The, basically, we journal all the records as they happen in a one after the other fashion, and those records are immutable, right? So, and they can be replicated in a cluster. We can snapshot them and we can treat them as our source of truth for our data. But again, the problem of database is that if it wasn't for the log itself, it would be it would work perfectly, just like Pulsar works perfectly, right? But by the time you start introducing this concept of tables on top of the logs, that's what the problem starts, right? So for a long time we have we have been thinking that maybe we were kind of a stuck and limited by the technology of our time, like because we are all about implement analytics with databases, right? But the reality is that there is this new trend, which is what we are calling actionable insights, where basically the focus of actionable insights is to try to bring the analytics as close as possible for when the data happens, right? Uh, there's actually a report from Forrester called Perishable Insights that I would highly recommend for all of you to take a look on that. And uh, basically what this report says is that, all right, the way we do analytics these days is basically processing data hours, days, or perhaps even months later after the data was created, right? And what is the problem with this? Uh, technically works, off, of course, but the problem with this is that sometimes we miss windows of opportunities, right? Uh, we might have like missing a business opportunity, maybe is a threat that went uh, invisible because we're not looking closely. And this is why we have streaming analytics, right? Streaming analytics is all about uh, bringing the processing as close to the data as possible, right? So uh, some people might like uh, very naively understand that, all right, so the in order for me to implement streaming analytics, it's all about put, uh, put Pulsar in front of my architecture. So you, I, I currently have a database. So if I put Pulsar in front of this, uh, um, database is going to be streaming analytics from this point on. And the reality is that doesn't work like this, right? Uh, the, the reality is that Pulsar is an amazing technology, but it's not just about you ingesting data and storing data at a high frequency and a high throughput, right? You also need to think about, okay, the storage part is working fine. That's what basically Pulsar does best, right? But what about the processing part? Right. What, what about the part where you're actually going to transform your raw data into insight? Right. And if we start, if we keep continue processing data in hours and days, you're not necessarily are implement streaming analytics. You're, you're basically are implement the behavior that we used to be, we used to implement on the old days of ETL, as well as in the old days, not very old, but it can be considered uh, old these days, the big data, right? Where you would stuck a lot of data into a Hadoop cluster, and then we would have all those processes around the, the clusters to extract the data, process it, and load someone else, right? So this is not actually near real time. So that's why we you have to take care about, okay, streaming data is more than just putting Pulsar in front of your architecture. You also actually have to think about it that all those layers over here, right? They actually have a meaning, right? Uh, the first most, the two most important layer are the stream storage, which is definitely what you're going to use Pulsar for, right? It is this amazing technology that can capture, ingest and store data at, at high throughput and it is durable, right? You can actually uh, trust that your, your data is going to be like a well stored. But you also have this layer called data analytics where you are going to use technology such as Elastic to actually uh, do this like insight and analytics thing, right? And what is the main characteristics of the data analytics layer? It needs to keep up and scale out along with your stream storage, right? And the same concept should apply for the stream ingestion, right? Your stream ingestion layer needs to be as scalable as your stream storage layer, right? Otherwise, you're going to be a bottleneck over here. Right. And if you have a situation where you need to transform data from the stream storage layer, Pulsar, to the data analytics layer, which is Elastic, your stream processor layer, which is usually implemented using technology such as a Pulsar Functions or Apache Flink, sometimes people also implement Elasticsearch for doing this, uh, this layer also has to be has to have the same characteristic, which is 
for uh, above anything, it cannot be a bottleneck in the uh, in the processing, right? So let's discuss very briefly each one of those layers, right? Uh, the first one is source data. Uh, one of the beautiful things about using Pulsar in architectures like this is that Pulsar is, uh, it, it, it doesn't care much about the format and the layout of the data you were actually stored on Pulsar, right? It can be virtually anything. Obviously, you can apply concept of schemas and uh, leverage technology such as Avro and Pranabuff, but ultimately you can start in anything you want on Pulsar. So that's what characterizes the source data, right? And the streaming JSON layer are going to be the technologies uh, that Pulsar provides to you to actually bring data into Pulsar, right? The, the three main ones would be the Pulsar clients. Uh, one of the great things about Pulsar is that it provides native clients be beyond Java, right? Well, one thing is to provide Java clients because Pulsar is written in Java, but it also provides clients for uh, C++, Node.js, Go, C Sharp, and Python uh, natively. And this is part of the project, right? This is not something that you have to rely on a different company to in order to have access to that, right? And if you don't want to actually write code to either bring data to, to Pulsar or send data from Pulsar to someone else, you can leverage Pulsar IO, which is a connector architecture, right? That's very scalable. One of the great things about Pulsar IO is that you don't necessarily need a different infrastructure for it. It runs on the same machines and brokers that compose your Pulsar clusters, right? They're only going to have a role different from the role from the other, the Pulsar nodes that stores data, right? And finally, uh, Pulsar also has this ability of expose different protocols on top of the cluster, such as uh, the Kafka protocol, the MQTT protocol, as well as the um, the AMQP protocol. So that means that if you have applications that read into store data into Kafka or RapidMQ or maybe Mosquito, which is an MQTT broker, you can just repoint in them to your Pulsar cluster and they will magically kind of, a, uh, they will understand the protocol and you can migrate those applications into Pulsar. So streaming gestions is very well served with Pulsar, right? And obviously that's the uh, the cherry of the, the technology, which is the stream storage layer. Right. Stream storage layer is fundamentally implemented using Pulsar, which is extremely scalable. Uh, it has some very, very well implemented durability characteristics. And more importantly, it scales along with your streaming gestion layer, right? What it means is that uh, by the time you have a volume X, and if you have to triple that, your stream storage layer will be able to keep up that tripling, right? Uh, without necessarily to, okay, now I have to actually put a lot of resources more in the, in the cluster or double that, not necessarily. Uh, obviously you have to increase resources uh, eventually, but it's it won't be like what happens with other technologies such as databases or big data or Hadoop, where you can, you have to think th uh, carefully in the amount of infrastructure that you have to put on the, the Pulsar cluster, right? Uh, because of the efficiency of the technology, right? Um, and you have the stream processor layer, right? The, as I mentioned before, there are three options that people usually use for implement stream processing. Uh, just so FYI, before we move forward, uh, the stream processor layer is not necessarily something that you should or must have in order to implement streaming data architecture, right? This is completely optional, right? Usually, and this is my opinion, right? Um, usually, I think it's important to have a stream processor layer uh, that precedes your data analytics layer when you when you do data creation, right? What is data creation? Is all those use cases where you want well meant data or in, in hand, uh, enhanced data, or maybe you want to reduce the noise, right? Uh, Deduplicate records and doing operations that will basically will cleanse the data before the data analytics actually takes place, right? And you can use Pulsar functions for this which is a very simple and powerful programming model. You might have some restrictions about what type of use case you, you might be able to implement with this, uh, such as windowing and aggregations that you need to like a buffer for a very period of long time. The Pulsar functions programming model, which is supposed to be stateless, won't be a very good fit for this. That's why you have options to do this with Apache Flink, which it provides a very close integration with Apache Pulsar or you can use Elasticsearch, right? Elasticsearch ultimately is going to be uh, where your data analytics layer is going to store everything, right? So if, if the data is stored there already, 
you can leverage the processing and aggregation characteristics of Elasticsearch to actually do the processing. Pretty much you can do everything you can do with Apache Flink into um, Elasticsearch, right? So it's, this is more like a, a matter of options, right? If you have a development team that has expertise in Apache Flink, please use Apache Flink, right? If you have a development team that knows a lot of Pulsar and they are used to Pulsar functions, use Pulsar functions. So the, the, the beauty of the technologies is that we have options, right? And finally, we have the data analytics layer, right? Uh, above anything, right? the data analytics layer needs to scale with the stream storage layer. That, that's the same story I've told before about stream storage has to keep up with stream ingestion, right? So all of them has to be like a, they, they have to scale concurrently, right? You, what the, the last thing you don't want is to, okay, I have this like Ferrari, which is implemented using Pulsar, right? It's extremely fast, it works great, but my data analytics layer is not keeping up with your, uh, with your volume, right? So this is, this is one of the characteristics that makes the technology provided from Elastic very suitable to, to be used in conjunction with Pulsar, right? And one of the greatest things about using data uh, Elastic as your data analytics layer is that uh, it is a very mature technology in the, in the community. So you won't have any problems to find developers that, all right, uh, how hard is it to find someone that knows to do aggregations and analytics with Elastic? Uh, not that hard because it is a, a technology that has been around for a very long time. Elastic is very known for its capabilities for log processing and unified, unified log management. So because of this, it's a technology that matured a lot in terms of how to shape, transform, and process data as they happen. So log is something that is has been a store of Elastic, but obviously it, can, it should not, it cannot and should not be used it only for this, right? And like I, like I like to joke, like best of all, everything becomes searchable. What, this is probably one of the key characteristics that Elastic provides because one thing is to for you to store data and to Pulsar and perhaps use Apache Flink for processing and perform aggregations and generate uh, dimensions and KPIs out of those aggregations. But what about those use cases where you want to make the same data set available, but for users to search? to perform full text searching capabilities, right? That's very hard to implement using an architecture such as Pulsar that basically journals and stores data as a streaming fashion, right? So when you combine the power of El Elastic with the power of Pulsar, you will end up with a technology that is very, very interesting to, uh, to implement streaming data architectures, right? So uh, I think everything that I have said so far sounded interesting, right? Uh, but there is always the question about, okay, how do I actually move from this, right? And go to actually this, which is the actual data analytics, right? So what I'm gonna do now is actually um, walk you through in a, a small demo that I've created, right? The This is the link of the GitHub repository that I've created where all the code is already there, right? you can play with. I'm just going to show you how it, how it works right now. And then you can actually have a sense about, okay, if it, it is, you can treat it as a small prototype about everything that I've just said, right? How to implement streaming data architectures using Pulsar with Elastic. So let's get to it. Um, I will stop sharing the screen for a moment. And I will, this is the actual, the GitHub repository that I, um, I have created. For, for this, so the link will be provided uh, for all of you. And I have here the code actually cloned in my machine. And basically you, you what you're gonna see in this code is going to be this three folders over here. Uh, I've separated the code strategically so you to for you to remember the layers that we've discussed during the presentation. So the first one is gonna be the uh, stream ingestion layer. Uh, as the name suggests, is going to be the layer that's going to put data into Pulsar, right? And then we have the stream storage layer, which is pretty much uh, Apache Pulsar. So if you go to stream storage, you're gonna see a Docker Compose file that spin up a Apache Pulsar instance using this image about called Pulsar All, right? This image is uh, has been picked strategically because one of the things that we're gonna leverage in this demo is the integration, the out-of-the-box integration between Pulsar and Elasticsearch. 
So if you use this image, the built-in connectors that Pulsar already provides to you will be there already, right? So you don't have to stall them manually, right? Uh, so as you can see here, basically what this container is gonna do is to re-expose some ports, the administration port from Pulsar and the transactional port from Pulsar. Uh, and they're all gonna belong to the same network, what, what I'm calling here streaming analytics. Why? Because if you go to the data analytics layer, you're gonna see that there's another Docker Compose that basically spin up a Elasticsearch and a Kibana, right? And both of them are actually, uh, are actually part of the same network. So that means that anyone and anything from the Pulsar cluster uh, can actually interact with Kibana and Elasticsearch because they're all in the same network, right? Um, and you also might have the ability to actually execute. There is a Docker Compose is not being shown here because I filter my IDE to do not show this, but in the code on GitHub, you're gonna see this, there is a Docker Compose that you can use, probably is, is what you are gonna use uh, in your laptops that basically spin up everything like Pulsar, Elasticsearch and Kibana, like all at once, as well as this, this is a small program that I've wrote in Go that keeps sending messages to Pulsar. That, and that's that's a, the message that we're gonna use as, as an example, right? So uh, let's start with the data analytics layer. So what I'm gonna do now here is to actually start the containers for Kibana and Elasticsearch. Uh, so as you can see here, they're creating the network and the volume that they're all gonna share for this environment. Um, if you never stall Elasticsearch images or Kibana, it might take a minute or two to download all the images from the Docker Hub repulsor, obviously, right? But if you have them, uh, it's gonna be real fast. So right now, Elasticsearch is already starting up, as you can see here, and subsequently, it will be Kibana, right? So we can actually check if Kibana is already running. If we go to the sport 5601, which is the standard Kibana port, right? And it is, as you can see here, uh, so the first thing I'm gonna actually do here is to show you in the management tab, right? That there's actually no indexes created at this point, And this is good because what this is what we want because for, for this demo. So indexes, for those of you that don't know, don't know Elastic is the primary data structure that where data is stored, right? Uh, think about indexes as your pulsar topics right this is your primary primary storage mechanism right so as you can see here there's no indexes which means that there's no data so this started from fresh okay uh, so with Elasticsearch and kibana running right so what i'm going to do now is to i'm going to open a new terminal for my stream storage layer aka apache pulsar and I'm going to start Pulsar over here as well, right? So essentially Pulsar will be running in this network that can talk with the Elasticsearch and Kibana instances because they belong to the same network, right? Uh, and while Pulsar is starting up, I would like to show you what I have in, here in this stream ingestion folder, right? You're gonna see that there's a lot of files. It might sound complicated, but in the end of the day, it's very easy to understand. Basically, what I've what I've created here, I have created those scripts called syncs that basically creates the an, an instance of a Pulsar I/O connector that will read messages from Pulsar and sends to Elasticsearch. We're gonna cover this in a moment, right? Also, you're gonna see that there's a small program that I've wrote here in GoLang that essentially what it does is to create a client with Pulsar, right? I'm gonna use that, I'm using the native client for Go provided by Pulsar. And the client is created out of this client, I create a producer as well. And then basically what the code does is in a forever loop, it's going to instantiate this data structure call that basically has a timestamp and three fields called X, Y, and Z. <laughs> very, very simple. 
and I marshal them into a JSON payload, and I keep sending them, technically the word is producing them, to a Pulsar topic that will afford all those records, right? So since the Pulsar cluster is already started, I'm gonna open up a new terminal here to actually see this, okay? So this is my Go program. Uh, I have here this script called read messages, right? Basically what the script does is to use the Pulsar client CLI that comes with your Pulsar cluster, right? Uh, not Pulsar cluster, your Pulsar installation that you, you, you might have. And basically what this Pulsar client, I'm going to connect with the local Pulsar that's running on my machine. And then I created my own subscription and out of the subscription, I'm going to consume all the messages for this topic called streaming analytics demo. So I'm going to execute the script right now just to show you that all the messages are actually being received being, uh, uh, from Pulsar. So this is a consumer, if you will, right? So basically what we're doing here with the Pulsar client, we are instantiate a consumer. And there is this script called send one off that basically uses the Pulsar client, but not only to consume, now we're going to produce and send this message over here that I've called oneoff.json. It is a static JSON payload for task purposes. So if we if we uh, execute this send one off right now, you're gonna see that, okay, the message has been produced. And as you can see here, it has been successfully received by the Pulsar consumer, which, which proves that, okay, the there's production and there's consumption from the Pulsar layer, remember, there's nothing on the data analytics layer at this point yet. So uh, along with this send one off, there is also this script called send messages, right? This script actually executes my Golang program that I've wrote, this one over here, right? That remember, uh, it's going to in a forever loop, keep sending messages and will pause every second, right? So this script basically keeps sending messages for you automatically. So I'm going to actually execute the script over here so we can test this behavior out. Okay, one off works good, but now I need to have continuously data being produced to Pulsar and I have Pulsar actually receiving them and printing them the messages that has been received. So this is obviously is working as um, as advertised, right? So now it is the interesting part. Well, for right now, I have everything actually running and working on the Pulsar layer, the Pulsar layer, which is the stream storage layer, right? So stream ingestion is okay, stream storage is okay. Data, data analytics is up and running, but it doesn't have any data, right? You remember, and here in Kibana, there are no indexes, right? So what we are going to do now is to um, like I mentioned before, I've created here the script called sync create, right? That basically is going to use the Pulsar admin CLI to communicate with the administration endpoint. And we're gonna create a new sync for this tenant, for this namespace. And we're gonna use a built-in uh, sync for Elasticsearch. I'm gonna name it. And basically the configuration file is going to be this YAML file over here, right? So if you look to this, the simplicity of this YAML configuration file, you can see that, all right, basically we are telling Pulsar how to contact Elasticsearch. This is the endpoint. Uh, this is the index that we want uh, Pulsar to actually create for us. And it will create automatically. And by this creation, it actually is going to create one shard with zero replicas, right? And actually you can tune this if you want it. For example, oh, I want I'm, I want to ensure durability also in my Elasticsearch layer. So you can actually have more than one shard and multiple replicas, which is basically the same concept that you might have in Pulsar as well for durability, right? When you have replicas in other nodes for, um, so if one of the brokers fails, you can actually restore the state from the network instead of restoring from the disk, right? So let's actually create this um, connector. Again, this is a connector that's part of the Pulsar IO architecture. It comes out of the box with Pulsar. So this means 
no code needs to be written in order this for happen. So let's just deploy the connector. So I'm going to execute sync create, which is basically is going to execute this script over here. Uh, let's execute. And it was created successfully, which is good. So let's just check if that is true, right? So if we look at here in Kibana and click on reload indices, you, you're going to see that now we have a new index here called SA demo, just like we have configured in the YAML file. And this index over here, you're going to see that there will be like some documents already stored there because the my producer is continuously running, right? So if I, as you can see here, the number keeps increasing and the storage size obviously is going to increase as well. So let's check, let's see the data actually uh, going on. So in order for us to see the data, we need to create a index pattern here on Kibana. So we're going to create an index pattern, index pattern called SA demo. So index patterns is a way for Kibana and Elasticsearch to understand the schema that are coming from the messages. So it, it kind of does a auto discovery for the layout of the messages. So it already discovered that one of the fields is a timestamp, right? And by the time it create this, you can see here that the whole schema from the message has been discovered by Kibana. So up to that point, we can jump here to the session called discover where we can actually see the data coming in. Uh, so here it is. So all those, all those lines, entries over here is one document that represents one of the messages coming from Pulsar into Elasticsearch. So I'm going to spend one of them over here for you to see. Uh, this is the table view of this document. And I can actually see the JSON view. And in the JSON view, you can clearly see here the, in the source field the actual payload that actually is coming from Pulsar, right? Everything else is metadata that has been included by Elasticsearch, right, for metadata purposes, right? So this is the trick, right? So um, one of the things that you can do here in Kibana is to keep updating every second so we can see the actual documents coming all the time. So as you can see here, in an every second fashion, there's a new uh, set of documents being created that are coming from um, Pulsar, right? But what we have done here so far is basically, okay, it it already created the index, it discovered the schema, but now let's play with the data, right? And uh, this is what data analytics is all about. So in order for do this, I'm going to use this visualization uh, feature here on Kibana. And there is a lens uh, feature where you can use, by the way, Everything that I'm showing here right now for, uh, about Elastic is open source and freely available, right? So this is not part of the commercial product. Just like Pulsar, it is an open source technology that you can just use, right? Uh, so basically what this Lens feature does is to allow us to create our visualization. So we can create a stacked bar over here where I can use my timestamp field for my X axis, right? And for my Y axis, I can actually just drop here on this axis, my X, my Y, and my Z, right? And as you can see here, I'm already distributing all the data uh, in time. So those are the averages of X, Y, and Z. You can actually change the expression. If you don't have one average, you can do count, maximum, mean, sum, or unit count, right? And as well as for the, um, the timestamp, we can actually uh, customize the interval instead of 30 seconds, we can do like five seconds interval or maybe one minute interval, right? And then this is one of the visualizations, I can save it. Let's call it just V1 and V1 has been created. And as you can see here, it is data analytics with live data, right? With data coming continuously from Pulsar layer. That, that's why the data analytics layer has to keep up with your um, with your streaming data layer. So let's create just another visualization before we create a dashboard out of this. So in this new visualization, I'm gonna create a gauge. And this gauge is gonna basically count the number of messages that are coming in, right? So I'm not gonna change anything, just gonna say V2. 
And now I can simply go to a dashboard and I can create a new dashboard and just add my V1 to the dashboard and V2 to the dashboard. So when we've done this, we now have a, so for you to get a feeling about, okay, what is the actual dashboard that users could leverage to see, right? And see the data actually coming alive, right? So uh, this is only for you to have a glimpse about, okay, uh, how an architectory that has streaming data in Planet using Pulsar and data analytics using Elastic looks like, right? So as you can see here, uh, apart from the scripts that I've created to, uh, for example, I've created a script here to deploy the connector that comes with Pulsar. But besides from this, there's no coding involved or at least too much coding, right? And even the code that I've wrote for um, inserting data into Pulsar, which I wrote in Go, uh, is not that complex, right? Uh, so basically th th that will be the code that you would write anyways in order to send data to Pulsar, right? Probably you might already have the code. Now, what we just did is to, okay, we connected the stream stars layer with Pulsar with the data analytics layer with Elasticsearch using Pulsar IO, using specifically this connector here that we've just applied, right? Speaking about connector, I would like to uh, emphasize a little details about this connector. I think those are going to be interesting ones for you to uh, take a look. Uh, so this connector, like you, like you probably noticed, it automatically creates the target index for you, right? So uh, this is important because most of the time uh, you want the data analytics layer to actually have the index created by the string stars layer because uh, as, you, as you can see here, the schemas also were, were fully discovered, right? So in a typical streaming data architecture, it usually is the stream stars layer that dictates the schema that the data analytics layer are going to use. One exception is when you have what when you want to change that schema, and that's why you have the streaming processing layer, right? Because my sometimes you might have to change the the schema or the layout, perhaps even change the format. For example, you can store product buff data into a Pulsar, but Elasticsearch only sees JSON, so you might need to do this transformation in payloads. And by the way, uh, this connector that I've used from Pulsar.io, the connector expects you to store data on JSON. So keep that in mind when you are reading for a topic that has it, the data will be sent to Elasticsearch. It, it does acknowledgement in acknowledgement a per message basis. This is something that actually I've, I've seen recently on the GitHub repository for this connector. Uh, there is a debate about, okay, but what if you want to implement a, instead of send each message for Elasticsearch, we can actually batch them and send batches to optimize the network connection. So uh, currently, keep in mind that if one of those messages fail, the acknowledgement or negate, negate acknowledgement will be in a per message basis, right? So this is very, very important because if you have a use case where consistency uh, matters for you, you have to make sure that whatever errors happens on the on the connector level, you might have to control the connector like uh, um, if it's uh, exactly once, at least once, right, uh, or effectively once. So you might have to control this properties on the on the connector level. And also, keys are not converted to index documents, right? This is important because that means that once the connector sends data to Elasticsearch, right they're not uniquely identified. So if it happens that you have the same message one after the other, of course, uh, because they're um, immutable, they're sent to Elasticsearch, there won't be a update on the second one. It will be always a append on the documents because even if you set a key on your message on the Pulsar side, those keys are not transformed into document IDs, right? Uh, actually, um, I've started a conversation about this on the project so we can change this behavior because this is something that you might want in the future, right? And since we're talking about uh, updates and search, keep in mind that the connector does not implement the duplication on a connector level, right? So uh, if you need to ensure 
that records will be unique, first of all, you have to use the connector properties to set, as I mentioned before, the uh, if it's going to be exactly once, mostly once, or effectively once, as well as you might want to do the deduplication on the Pulsar side, right? So Pulsar has all the capabilities out of the box to do this. Basically, you want to turn your producer and how to ensure things like this. But the point is that by the time your connector from Pulsar AR picks the message from the topic, it we won't take care of any data application process before sending data to Elasticsearch. So as you can see here, there is a little bit about of control that you need to ensure in a Pulsar level before actually uh, implement this integration with uh, Elasticsearch and Pulsar, right? So uh, I think that covers what I would like to show here today. Uh, the last message that I would like to share with you, which is a call to action. Uh, if you wanna move forward with implementations like this, I would highly encourage you to do those five steps. The first one is uh, start playing with the technology from Pulsar, which is open source. Elastic as well is open source, right? And there is the communities. I think that's the best resource for you to start learning and ask for help, right? Uh, the, the link for the Pulsar community is here, which is very active and there's very good people there that can help you. Uh, this is one of the amazing things about Pulsar. Everybody is so friendly and willing to help. Uh, the same goes with Elastic Community. Uh, the Elastic Community has been around for more time, but it shares the same characteristics of Pulsar. Everybody's like more than happy to help. Um, and there is no such thing of, okay, there's so basic questions, right? We welcome every type of questions in there. And if you want to go production with those technologies, keep in mind that Stream Native provides a managed service for Apache Pulsar. So that means that you don't necessarily have to have expertise at home in order to build a your own cluster, highly optimized. Stream Native can do this for you. And same goes for Elastic. Uh, Elastic has this service called Elastic Cloud that offers you, offers you uh, Elasticsearch and Kibana as a service for you. So you don't necessarily have to have expertise in house, right? And obviously this is all options. If your use case, you have people in your team that can manage Elastic clusters or Pulsar cluster for you, go just use it because what, what matters is that those are amazing technologies. And as you can see here, they're very interesting and fun to use. With that, I would like to close and thank you for evaluating this session. And thank you for the organizer also for allowing me to speak at this conference. I, I am a huge fan of the, the Pulsar community and it was my pleasure to be able to share a little bit about this streaming data technologies with you today. Uh, if you have any questions, I will be more than glad to answer them. And if not, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Ricardo, for sharing your deep dive story with streaming analytics with Pulsar and Elastic. Your tale is really interesting and cool. We really love the Elastic world you, you demonstrate to us. Yeah. Thank you very much for your contribution to our Pulsar community. Uh, I think we can just uh, exist this session and enter another session with Bob. Okay. Sure. Thank you very much. My Bye. pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.